Hey Kriegers, Robert here and welcome back to part 2 of the Sokai Station Diorama to finish this custom amiibo month. In the last video we were able to show you guys how we made the base of the map and how we added the start of the details and the fish stick. In today's video we will show off how we finished the diorama including the painting, electronics and how it all looks after 3 custom amiibo month worth of videos. The first thing we still had to do was to add the sand to poke the beach for that sandy look. and to the spawn points to make the mud texture that we can see during the trailer. Making use of some fine sand and some larger pebbles with which we can decorate the areas. And afterwards we can use some mock parch mixed with some water to spray over all of the materials to lock them in place. With that final texture added we could start on the painting of the diorama. Beginning with a black paste coat using some spray cans. And I do mean spray cans. One and a half to be exact. For both the diorama itself and the 13 little holders for the amiibos. Next we had already spent a full day of work off camera adding 4 coats of this plaster like color to a lot of the walls of the diorama. But once those were added we could finish the first day by adding some black to the bases and some white to the tops of the soda cans that we had spread around the beach landing in part 1. Then we only needed to add some yellow to the tops, some dark green to the bottles. and a sandy brown for the little corks to finish the litter. Then I really wanted to test out the system for the fish stick. So for this we had to rewire a 360 degree servo by removing the connections to the motherboard and then wiring up some new connections with some new wires we could then make it so we can directly power the servo from some batteries. Once these modifications were complete then we could add this setup underneath the fish stick with some 3D printed gears. Since the air regulated servo will spin a lot faster now. So we needed to make sure it would turn the flyers at a smaller RPM. We could then add these to the foam board with some hot glue. And some super glue was then also used to lock the gears to the axle of the flyer. And with a little test we have confirmation that everything works. So to celebrate let's add the metallic colors to the tower. With a darker metallic color for the base of the tower. Then after that is dried we can add some silver and copper details to some of the panels on the sides. And finally we can add some dust effects to the places that also naturally accumulate a lot of moisture. Like the tops of some panels and some streaks down to the lower parts of the tower. And while we're already hard at work with these metallics, we could also add these to the corrugated paper panels scattered around the beach and the spawn points. 
with some more coats of both silver and copper. Next, we've mixed some yellow with a bit of orange and brown to be able to paint fries that are skewered on top of the radio towers. Like seriously, what's up with the salmonids and wanting to be eaten so much? Then a darkened silver is painted over all three lantern posts and over the radio towers. And to finish the lantern post, we could also add a little bit of paint to the lantern casings themselves. Now to give those a chance to dry, we could go over the spiraling tower to add this terracotta-like color to all of the curbs that we added to the two levels. Both these and the outer circles of the spawn point can then receive two coats of this paint. Then this red and brown mixture is used for the sun weathered red paint on the iron bridge to the water. Making sure to not only get the top, but also the bottom and the supports on the sides. Continuing with the weathered colors, I combined a copper with some black to make this old copper for the top of the diorama and the raised platforms to the slides that lead to the water. Next, we could finally also add the base of the asphalt texture to the diorama. By mixing up a very dark grey and adding some brown and a bit of olive green, we get the perfect color for most of the vertical levels of the diorama. While that was drying, I got a chance to mix a red with some brown and silver to make this rusted red that we can now add to all of the edge covers around the diorama. Then a light grey is mixed with a bit of olive green for the cracked concrete on the lower platform of the fish piece. After all of that, I needed a little bit of a break from all of these greys and metallics. So why not go and add all of the yellow stripes to the warning labels on some of the edges. These we can then paint on both the top and the sides of the edges. But alas, we did need to go back to the asphalt. But luckily, it was a fun job. We got to add the lighter texture to the platforms. By putting only a little bit of paint onto an old brush, we can add a random natural texture to the paint to make it look like some old asphalt or concrete, bringing a lot more depth to these otherwise quite boring platforms. And this dry brushing can then also be done to the lower concrete platform by mixing in a bit of white to the original color and then lightly brushing the paint over the raised textures around the area. Finally, we also got to add some darkened silver again to the fences all around the diorama. Using a soft and white brush to let the paint grab onto these fences naturally to also create some darker shadows where the brush can't reach.
Then we got to color the wire that leads around the diorama with a nice bright red. And finally, after three days of painting, we got all of the stuff within and surrounding the texture surfaces painted. So at last, we could add the color to the mud with a dark brown as a base. With a base coat of a white, mixed with some yellow and a bit of brown. Since we wanted these textures to leak onto the surrounding colors, we needed to add those first before we could do these for optimal effects. Then after all the base coats were dry, we could do the exciting dry brushing to bring out all that nice texture. With a lightly yellowed white for the beach and a normal brown for the mud on top. And now with a little extra surprise for the diorama, some neon lights. Or well, they're still LED lights, but by using these LED or EL wires, we can simulate a neon sign on this scale. By using some patterns that I drew out on Illustrator and engraved on a laser cutter, I was able to drill some holes along this pattern and using some floral wires I added to hold the wires in place, I was able to make three kinds of lights to use all around the diorama. But with the laser, I was even able to make a fourth kind of neon sign. Although these could not be made with the LED wire, but by using some transparent green pieces of plexiglass and some matte black ones to hold them in place, I was still able to make a nice sign that only needed a little bit of extra backlighting. For these we then only needed to puzzle the two kinds of pieces together, and then after scuffing the backing with some sanding sponges, I was able to add some hot glue and press them into some baking paper to get a smooth back locking all the pieces together. This I could then do for both the normal sign and even the leftover pieces for a little extra addition later on. The neon sides are then woven through the fences and glued in place with the hot glue grabbing onto the ends of the floor wires on the back. After which the wires are twisted with a drill for easier weaving throughout the diorama. And all four are then connected. And even the little leftover sign gets added as a broken, fallen version on the secret beach. 
But with the sign on the fish piece added and wired, we can officially join the two pieces to the rest of the diorama. And with this added, I also needed to paint the flyers. So, after a coat of white primer for the bodies and a black for the helmets and gear, we got to add the oh so nice green paint that takes three coats to cover properly. <coughs> Luckily, it's not so bad with the salmon gray for the skin and the light yellow for the base of the eyes. Like, seriously, why does that green take so much coats? But once we did our little ring around Rosie, we only need to add this red stripe to the iris and the ends of the propellers. And some gunmetal for the helmets and the gear. Then we needed to freehand these agent mine like drawings scattered around the right side of the diorama with some green and orange. And while they're dry, we got the chance to add some little foliage to the diorama with some grasses and tufts and some ferns around the spawn points. At last, we could wire the final parts of the LEDs with the lanterns. These we can wire above ground, since the wires can be seen waving in the wind during the trailers. So this makes it a lot easier than needing to pry around the inside of the limited space in the diorama. For these we then only needed to press the yellow LEDs into the lantern holders, then solder them up to some long wires and band these around the post and lock them in place with some super glue. Then we needed to lead those back all the way to the main satellite posts, where these could get soldered together before beginning to be woven into the diorama to be added to the circuit with the other LEDs and the neon signs. Then we only have the helicopter left to add with its transparent acrylic post to finish up the diorama. And with that, we can officially announce- <coughs> Seriously, again? Didn't we already do this bit for the Goldie episode? <coughs> Fine, okay, but let's do this quickly then. 
Since we now also have a King Salmonid to make, which is a very big figure, I thought I could still do it with the epoxy sculpts. But very soon I realized just how much clay I would need to spend on that. Luckily, some air drying clay could still work just as fine on a figure this large. So, after the epoxy sculpt had solidified, I added a base layer of air drying clay to finish the rest of the body of the king. Then it came the task to make all of the scales that adore the king's back. Luckily, by making some stamps with some pieces of PVC pipe that I sharpened on one end, I was able to make the process a lot smoother. Now I only needed to press out the pieces, do a little bit of smoothing on the edges, and then they were already good to be added to the back of the figure. And after adding some more details to the head, and the fins were added, we had to let that dry. After the outside had solidified enough, I was able to start removing all of the stuffing that I used for the base of the figure. All of these newspapers and aluminium foil could then be removed to leave us with a nice hollow figure that we could then let dry some more, even on the inside now. So after an overnight rest, we still had to add some final details to the king, like his back fin, using some more 2mm EVA foam. After which we could also cut a little strip from the leftover piece to make all of the teeth that the king still has left. Now we only need the tongue. Using some regular old miniature chains, some super glue, and this 3D printed Grisco anchor. Recognize those familiar endpoints? But only once all of these accessories were added, could the king receive his primer coat of an acrylic black. This is to really seal up all of the air drying clay so it doesn't absorb any more of the paint. And once that was painted on, we could add the LEDs and the hot glue for his bulging eyes.
Then finally for the paints, I was able to use my airbrush for the first time for some easier coloring in this beast. Using a peach, white and a sandy color for the belly of the king. And a dark gray, olive green and a black for the scales. Even underestimating the amount of paint and needing to make some extra. But I got to learn a lot about the airbrush by using it on a bit of a bigger target than my usual amiibos. So maybe in the future I could try it on something a bit more normal sized? And with a blood red mixed with a bright red for the fin and the mouth, I was able to paint all the base colors of the king. Then I only needed a few touch-ups and to add these pearlescent colors to the scales by thinning down some of the colors before applying them. After which I could add the black back to the chains and the anchor. Then to give them a chance to dry, I could do a little bit more airbrushing for some transparent yellow on the eyes. And with that done, we could even go back to the chains with a gunmetal to finish those off. And after blowing some hot glue onto the figure from the base to simulate waves. And adding the transparent paint and gloss to it. And doing the same for the Samurai Next Wave sign. We can officially announce the end of the Samurai Custom Amiibo Months with the finishing of the Splatoon 3 Next Wave Sakai Station Diorama. And we also wanted to give a very special thanks to our newest Patreon, Rina. Thank you so much for wanting to support us. With Patreons like these allowing us to make these way too big projects.
Hey Crew Gears, Robo here, and we hope you enjoyed the last video of this custom amiibo month. At last, after three full custom amiibo months with the first and second series of amiibos, and then a full month of extra work on the diorama, finally have our ultimate summer done display finished. I'm so very happy with how it turned out. With all of the amazing details that we've been able to put into the accessories of the diorama, the placement of the customs, the lights that we've been able to include all around the station, and even being able to make the fish sticks spin around with the server motor. But even despite all of that, it really got to be an amazing project, and I'm so very happy to be able to call it my best diorama yet. In that way, it's kind of a shame with how I'm storing it now. With how you can't really take a look all around the diorama. So we have to go and see if we can do a little bit of remodeling in the room to make sure it will be easier to view the station from all angles. But that's going to be all from us for now. Keep those creative gears turning, and we will see you guys in the next video.